So I'd like to start by thanking the organizers for the opportunity to speak today. And I also want to say that everything uh, that I talked about is joint work with Shalini Bai. So let's begin with motivation. So to begin with, let's take X to be an algebraic variety. Now, to this algebraic variety, I can associate an object called db co of x. And here I want to do db co is a pre triangulated infinity canon. Maybe if you like a db. So the left hand side of this, this one here is a classical object. And by classical object, I mean that it's locally modeled on the spectrum of the commutative ring. Right hand side, um, I like to say that it's a quantum object. And, and what I'm referring to is the general philosophy of non commutative geometry, which says that it's reasonable to view pre translated and epitome categories as a space, non commutative space. And so we can therefore regard DB co X as a non commutative partner of the classical object X. So, given a classical object, as before, we can talk about various properties. So we can talk about whether the subject is smooth, whether it's proper, and we can talk about its dimensions. Now, similarly, in the, in the realm of non-commutative spaces, there are also notions of uh, smoothness, properness, and dimension. So here's a definition. Um, let C be a pre-planigated infinity category over a field. Then we'll say it's proper if the dimension of the cohomology, the cohomology of the home spaces is finite dimension. And we say it's smooth if the diagonal bimodule is perfect. This means that you can resolve it by uh, doing it a bimodule, like represented, tensor products are represented. So the notion of dimension for a pre transmitted infinity category, well, it's a little bit hard to say. So let's begin by letting C be a triangulated category. So we say that an object G in C generates the category C in time at most T, where T is some integer. If every object of C can be built from G by taking direct sums, shifts, sum ends, and at most T points. So you can take as many direct sums, shifts, and sum ends as you like, but you can only, you're only allowed to take T points. And the generation time of this object G is the smallest T which works. Okay, so, so this, this notion depends on an object G, a generator G. And then we say that the dimension of the category C is the smallest generation time over all possible generators. And now if C is, a, is an infinity category, then uh, we say that its dimension is the dimension of triangulated category, which is associated. I should say there are some other notions of non commutative dimension, which, which one also meets in the literature. This notion is due to OK, and it's the only one I'll be talking about. OK, so. Um, uh, a natural question one can ask is, do these um, non-commutative notions of smoothness, properness, dimension, actually recover their classical counterparts? So you have this classical space X and you associate to it this non-commutative partner, db for X, and you want to know, kind of, do these notions of dimension, properness, smoothness, and so on, do they actually match? So, so here's a fact. Um, let X be an algebraic variety. Then X is smooth if and only if perfect of X is smooth, and similarly X is proper if and only if perfect X is proper. So perfect X is, is some other non-commutative space that you can associate to X. And if X is smooth, then it's the same as DB code. I won't be talking about perfect. So when it comes to dimension, uh, the situation is not at all understood. So there are certainly examples um, where the dimension of X Classical dimension of X is, is less than the dimension of DB to X. 
Yeah. Yeah. Those examples were the same, and um, these examples can be smooth, they can be smooth, unless anything goes. However, there is a conjecture, and this conjecture is due to Orlov. It says that if X is a smooth quasi projective variety, then the non commutative dimension agrees with the classical dimension. So I should say Orlov has many conjectures. And when I refer to Orlov's conjecture in this talk, I mean this, this one. So in the paper uh, in which he, he introduced the notion of dimension, uh, well, he proves that one has this equality. So, so the real content of Orlov's conjecture is to improve upper bound. That's for smooth x, just if you can bound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the lower bound is, is true more generally. Okay, so Orlov's conjecture has been studied by uh, many people. And uh, I want to mention just a few cases. Um, this is far from an exhaustive, exhaustive list. Um, so, first of all, uh, in his original paper, he approved the conjecture for affine varieties, projective spaces, and quadrates. And in the paper in which he introduced the conjecture, uh, Orlov proved it for curves. Uh, another example is toric surfaces, and, and there are many more special cases. Many more examples. Okay, um, so the main theorem that I'm going to talk about today is uh, stated right here. And this is joint work, once again, with Sean and Vlad. And the theorem says that uh, Orlov's conjecture is true for any algebraic variety which admits uh, Weinstein mirror uh, with dimension at most six. So here's the dimension of M is the real dimension of the Weinstein manifold. So, um, this uh, this in particular implies the conjecture for some examples which were not previously known in star knowledge. So, for instance, toward threefolds um, and certain log Calabria services, which were studied by Hacker and Keating. And it also reproves some previously known cases of the conjecture uh, using different methods. Um, and finally, in the uh, in the case where X admits a mirror, which is a dimension greater than, um, than uh, well, strictly greater than six, then uh, we, we don't prove uh, Orlov's conjecture, but we do improve uh, this, this upper bound a little bit. Okay. So I'd like to give some background on Weinstein manifolds. So I know we've they've been talked about before in this conference, but I nonetheless like to say a little bit about them. All right, so um, to begin with, we have Liouville manifolds. So a Liouville manifold is an exact symplectic manifold, so particularly an open symplectic manifold, which at infinity looks like the contact, the symplectization of a contact manifold. So the picture you could have in mind for those who are Following in person is that the cotangent bundle of a smooth manifold, for instance. And this Liouville manifold is said to be Weinstein if it satisfies a tameless condition. And I'm not going to really ever emphasize the difference between Weinstein and Liouville. There's also a notion of a Weinstein pair. So Weinstein pair is a Weinstein manifold with another could mention two Weinstein submanifold, which is embedded at infinity. So the picture you could have in mind is something like the cotangent bundle of a smooth manifold plus some extra data at infinity, which here I just draw as two points. And then in general, in the high dimensional picture, it's this data at infinity is a co-dimension to Weinstein. Finally, there's a notion of a uh, Weinstein sector. And this is basically a Weinstein manifold with, with boundary. So the picture to have in mind is the code is the, the cotangent bundle of a manifold with boundary. So for instance, T star of an integral, that's a Weinstein sector. 
Now, to any one of these objects, to either a Weinstein manifold, a Weinstein pair, a Weinstein sector, you can associate an invariant called the Rapp Fukaya category, which is an A infinity here. Okay, so let's also talk about skeleton. So the skeleton of, skeleton of a Weinstein manifold um, is a subset of points in this manifold which don't escape to infinity under the positive U of O. So if you remember, I wrote this down here. There's, a, there's this lambda, which is part of the data of a Liouville manifold. This is a one form who's such that D lambda is subtracted. So it determines a vector field called the Liouville vector field. And the skeleton is a set of points such that when you flow along the Liouville vector field, you don't go off to infinity. So in particular, in the case of a cotangent bundle, the skeleton is just a zero section. That's the skeleton. There's also a notion of skeleton for Weinstein pairs. And uh, well, the definition is written on the slide. It's a set of points which don't escape to the complement of the skeleton of the co-dimension two contact submanifold, uh, submanifold of infinity. So to draw the picture in this case, you have a cotangent bundle of the skeleton would look something like, like this. And there's also, I guess we could also talk about a skeleton for uh, wine sense. <clears throat> what I want to emphasize is that Weinstein manifolds, Weinstein pairs, these are objects of subjective topology. And I, I emphasize the topology. Um, there's a notion of homotopy for Weinstein pairs, Weinstein manifolds. And this doesn't change the Fukaya category. However, it violently changes the skeleton. By homotope, the, if I start playing around with the, the one form on a cotangent bundle of a manifold, uh, the skeleton is no longer going to be the zero section. It can be something drastically different. However, the Fukai category won't change. And this is going to be very important in the rest of my. Okay, so let's return to the main theorem. So we say that a variety, an algebraic variety X, is homologically mirror to a Weinstein pair M comma V if DB cob X is equal to the Fukaya category of the Weinstein pair. And this equality is derived equivalent. So this allows us to reformulate the original theorem, which I stated previously. What we're actually going to prove is the following thing. We're going to prove that if M V is a polarizable Weinstein pair, Polarizable is topological assumption. And if the dimension of M is at most six, then this inequality holds. And if N is greater than, than greater than or equal to three, where we have a more general statement. So this implies that the previously stated main theorem, because if you remember, we only had to prove an upper bound. And if you assume that uh, you have this equality, then you precisely prove the desired upper bound. So uh, five is, is sharp in the sense that we certainly have examples of Weinstein pairs which saturate this inequality. Uh, six is, for six there's no expectation that this is sharp. I have no idea how to produce a Weinstein manifold or a Weinstein pair whose dimension is strictly greater. Than Such examples may exist, I have no idea. Okay, are there any questions? Okay. So let me try to give a heuristic uh, summary of the main ingredients which go into proving uh, this, this theorem. And I, I should say that the summary I'm going to give, when I say it's heuristic, this means, in other words, that this is how we were thinking about the proof when we were working on this, but this is not actually how we implement it. Um, but to actually implement the proof, we, we essentially hardly ever use the word Fukai category. We work entirely in the context of the local sheet. And this is for essentially technical reasons. But uh, we were always thinking of it, to mention. OK, so there, there are two ingredients. And the first one is the Cauchy property for Rap Fukai. So 
let M be a Weinstein manifold. And heuristically, if you have a, a sub, say an open subset of the skeleton, you can associate to this open subset a Weinstein sector, which is obtained by thickening the open subset. So to draw a picture, if you have the skeleton of a cotangent bundle, which is just the zero section, and you have an open ball in the zero section, then the cotangent bundle of the open ball is what I'm calling thick of the thick of U. And it embeds inside the cotangent bundle of the original manifold. So we have an embedding of thick of U inside thick of the big skeleton. If you take now, you apply the functor Fukaya category, you get an embedding of Fukaya categories. You get an embedding of the Fukaya category of T star of U into the Fukaya category of T star of the original manifold. So, so you have this assignment to an open interval, to an open subset U. I can associate thick of U, which is a Weinstein sector. And I can associate the Fukaya category of this Weinstein. And I can take Fukaya category of this Weinstein sector. In other words, to my U, I can associate the Fukaya category of thick U. So this assignment, U goes to Fukaya category of thick U. The main fact that we're going to use is that this forms what's called a Cauchy plus cap. So, so it's certainly a pre-Cauchy. Why is it a pre-Cauchy? Because if I have some open set U and I have a slightly bigger open set B, then thick of U embeds into thick of B. So I have now a map from the Fukai category of thick of U into the Fukai category of thick of U. But what's not at all obvious is that this is actually a Cauchy of infinity categories. To be a Cauchy, if you need to check a certain property of pre cauchys you need to check essentially this type of property. So, so in other words, to be a Cauchy means that one has this type of equality. And a precise version of this was proved by Ganatra partnership. The version that they proved doesn't involve the word thick anywhere, but heuristically it corresponds to what I'm saying. So why is the Cauchy property relevant to studying dimension? It's relevant due to the following lemma, which says that if you have a diagram of infinity categories indexed by a poset, then you can estimate the dimension of the co-limit in terms of the dimension of the pieces plus the depth of the diagram. So the depth of a diagram means the long, so the depth of a, a poset is the longest chain of elements in the poset. The depth of an element in the poset is the longest chain of elements which terminate that chosen. And, and the claim I'm making here is that actually, um, if you have a diagram of A, it can be categories which is indexed by a poset, then you can estimate the dimension of the co-limit in terms of the dimension of the piece. And so no, no in particular that if, if, if you knew for some reason that uh, these guys here, the dimension of the pieces is zero, then you would get that the dimension of the co-limit is at most the, dimension, the depth of the diagram minus one. And in our particular situation, this term is gonna be zero. And so we're gonna be able to focus entirely on this. On these two terms. Okay, so in other words, we have, this co-limit property, we know the Cauchy property tells us that we can express the Fukai category as a co-limit. And the, we also have a lemma which tells us that we can bound the dimension of the co-limit in terms of the dimension of the pieces. So it remains to understand the dimension of the pieces. Any questions? Okay. So this is where we turn to the second a uh, key ingredient, which is arborealization. And another term you could use for arborealization is simplification of singularities. So I've drawn these pictures on the board, which are supposed to be skeleta, 
And they look very nice. They look like the zero section of a cotangent bundle. But maybe a better way you should draw a skeleton is as some absolutely terrible, uh, maybe Whitney stratified set. Um, skeleton can be extremely nasty. And in general, if you take a Weinstein manifold, there's no reason to have a nice skeleton. And, um, and therefore, uh, if you wanted to use the Cauchy property uh, and apply it to a certain skeleton, you'd be in, in big troubles because the skeleton is, is just nasty. So. Fortunately, there's a simplification of singularities uh, result. And this, is, this comes out of a program which is called the arborealization program. So let me say a little bit about that. Okay, so here's the basic uh, the starting point. To a rooted tree or sign rooted tree, T, one can associate a stratified space called arb t of dimension uh, number of vertices minus one. And we say that arb t is the arboreal singularity determined by t. So let me draw one. So t is a point, the singularity is also a point if t is. Um, two points with, which are connected by an edge, then T looks like something like that. You have three points connected by an edge, T looks something like this. And so on. And, and these are Boyer singularities, so these are stratified spaces, but but they also have um, thickenings. So you can take uh, this thing, singularity, and you can thicken it to be a Weinstein sector. <clears throat> and what's so great about these arboreal singularities is that this category is computable. And the basic uh, the fact is that the Fukai category of the thickening of an arboreal singularity is uh, given by uh, well, the curve of the representation category of associated tree quick. So essentially a representation category tree quick. OK, so, so let's define uh, the skeleton. Let's say that the skeleton of a Weinstein pair MD is arboreal if all of the singularities are of arboreal. So they're in this class of singularities which are determined by trees. Great. So a major portion of the arborealization program has now been realized. So in particular, one has the following theorem, which tells us that if you have a Weinstein pair MD, polarizable, then after applying a homotopy, you can actually ensure that the skeleton is arboreal. This is why I call this maybe a simplification of singularities theorem, because you have a possibly nasty skeleton, but after applying some homotopies, which don't change the Fukai category, you can make it arboreal. Okay, and to relate this to the to dimension, which is what we're ultimately talking about, I want to mention one final fact, which is probably ultimately due to the Gabriel, although it was certainly not stated in this form, which says that the dimension of representation categories of tree quivers is very small. It's either zero, if the tree is Dinkin diagram, or it's one. And this is great because if you return to, to this inequality, we wanted to estimate the dimension of a co-limit and we're very happy if the dimension of the pieces is small, because we want to make this the right hand side as small as possible. And we know that if we're talking about uh, thickenings of arboreal guide, then it's going to be small. It's going to be zero or one. Okay, so I've mentioned now the, the main ingredients. So let me uh, give an idea of what you do with this uh, to actually prove the theorem. This is kind of sketchy, but uh, 
properties of the idea. So to prove the theorem, we implement the following procedure. You start with a pair MV. Then you arborealize it so that the skeleton has only arboreal symbols. Then you take um, a triangulation of the skeleton. And you cover the skeleton by stars of the vertices of your triangulation. OK, then you thicken these stars, which gives you a cover of, I mean, yeah, then, and you, you thicken the stars, and you return to, um, well, to this Cauchy property, which tells you that you can compute the Fukai category of the co-limit, namely the Fukai category of the big manifold, in terms of the, piece, the, the pieces, which are thickenings of um, stars of our boils. Great. Um, so now we're going to appeal to the co-limit bound. Um, so, so we apply the Cauchy bound and this theorem of Gabriel. And essentially, the upshot is that um, we want to we want to use this bound. We know that these terms are all zero, and so we just have to look at the depth of this diagram. And it's, since it comes from a triangulation, for just common employer reasons, the depth is n plus one. So n plus my n plus one minus one is exactly what we want. So this is basically the idea. Um, very sketchy summary. Yeah. Um, so a few remarks. Uh, first of all, so, so you may ask, where does this assumption uh, n less than three show up? But remember, in our theorem, we were assuming that the dimension of the variety is at most three. And why do we have to assume this? And the reason is that um, the appeal to this theorem, well, you either get a zero in the Dinkin case or a one if the tree is not Dinkin. But happily, um, a tree with the most four vertices is always a Dinkin type tree, which means that if you're dealing with Weinstein manifolds of dimension at least six, then the only trees which are, which are going to show up are going to have at most four vertices. So they're all going to be Dinkin, so we get an optimal bound. But in general, uh, we don't know. Uh, there's, there's no control, so you only get a weaker bound, uh, which is like two n minus three, which which comes out of the same argument, but uh, it's weaker because you don't have to think of it. And the final remark I want to make is that, uh, as I said before, this proof summary I've given is not actually how we, not not how we implement the argument. Um, everything gets done using like below questions. And the basic reason is that um, to talk about thickenings of skeleta uh, is actually technically quite challenging. And um, you certainly didn't know how to do it. And um, Michael Oko Sheaves allow one to, to, to sort of get around a lot of the difficulties. Um, so, yeah, so in a sense, everything I've said is um, purely, uh, certainly purely heuristic. Okay. Are there any questions so far? Not that I know of. Um, there's a B-side analogy of the, the Cauchy property, but uh, arborealization, to me at least, feels like the truly symplectic input of this type of argument because um, you know you, you really have this incredible degree of flexibility that uh, the homotope things and algebraic geometry, um, I haven't ever encountered this type of flexibility. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> how am I doing it time? Uh, well, I've got some time. <laughs> um, yeah. So, so what happens if you try to engineer something or at least to be bigger than what, what, what you run up against? Um, well, the first thing you run up against is that this is really just an inequality. And uh, even if you can make these bits, these things all large, uh, um, there's no reason in principle that, um, so, so I mean, even if you had a co diagram where the dimension of each piece is large, at the end of the day, um, 
I, I don't see a reason why uh, this inequality will be sort of saturated. Uh, you might still be un unlucky and find that the dimension of the column is somehow small. This is akin to, I guess, like on the B side, you said there's two N, if you move its upper bound. On the B side, the upper bound is two N, yeah. So you somehow have a two N minus three upper bound here without. Without it doing anything, yeah. Yeah, but. Uh, yeah, I actually, I, I was told recently that um, uh, an algebraic geometer whose name I've forgotten, um, so a graduate student at Harvard, um, has an alternative argument purely using algebraic geometry, which would give an upper bound of 2n minus 1 in the toric case and maybe also in some other cases. So, um, so I think there's also grounds within algebraic geometry to, to think that the 2n bound is not going to be the right one. So can you um, construct sort of gen the generators uh, from these these subcategories and the sum of topology, or is this is this just purely a numerical? Um, I haven't really thought about it. Um, that's why I, I don't see how to do it off the top of my head. Okay, so, so I wanted to, to mention a few other things, sort of some uh, directions, questions. Yeah, so, so the, the first thing is um, essentially continuing uh, off David's question. Uh, we, we absolutely don't expect the bound, uh, the high dimensional bound to be optimal. Um, however, um, so in cases where you have mirror symmetry, where you have a Weinstein pair on one side and Algebraic variety on the other, often you know quite a bit about this Weinstein pair. And you may be able just by hand to arborealize it in a way that all of the singularities are of the income type. Um, and in that case, the, the argument would give the would exactly the same argument would give the optimal outcome. So this is certainly something that one could try to do. Um, also, this polarizability assumption, um, it should be probably possible to get rid of it. Um, so there are some deformations called non-characteristic deformations to introduce by Nedler, um, which uh, one can perform, but which um, preserve microlocal sheaf categories, but there's no, they, they don't uh, preserve a homotopy type of Weinstein manifold. But one could also use these types of deformations um, and uh, potentially get rid of the polarization. So I also want to talk about um, additive invariance and some, some consequence of this proof for additive, additive invariance of uh, Weinstein pairs. So an additive invariant is a functor which takes uh, pre-triangulated infinity categories to a building group. And you assume that it sends Morita equivalences to isomorphisms and that it sends semi-orthogonal decompositions to dress. So an example is Hausdorff homology, Hausdorff homology, K theory, Hausdorff homology. There are many, many more. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so for example, if you apply an additive invariant to tree quiver, you just get uh, or F to the enemies. So, okay. Okay, so what do other invariants have to do with um, the story I've just described? Well, um, if you have a polarizable Weinstein manifold of any dimension, then the proof that I've tried to describe, it presents this the Foucault category of this Weinstein pair as a co-limit of representation categories of people. Not necessarily Dinkin, but that doesn't actually matter. Now, one way to define a co-limit is as follows. Two-step process. You first, so you have a diagram of categories, and you first perform a semi-orthogonal gluing of this diagram of categories. People call this a, a growth and deconstruction. And then you apply a quotient map. So, so this equality here, it implies that there is a quotient map 
from the semi-orthogonal gluing of a bunch of representation categories and free quivers to the radical category. Now, this guy here is smooth and proper, first of all, because representation categories. But now, if you knew that this category is also proper and it's always smooth, but in cases where it's all, where there are many cases of interest where it's also proper, uh, such as cases coming from mirror symmetry, then, then you would be able, to, then you can pull back this map and you get an embedding of uh, Fukai category into this category. Uh, which has a orthogonal complement. So, in other words, you get a semi orthogonal decomposition of growth of, of perf KT uh, in terms of these components. Okay. So, now if you have an additive invariant, then, well, by the definition of additive invariance, it splits. Uh, so, um, in other words, uh, F of, okay, this is a type of this should be a sigma, but uh, F of the growth and deconstruction of representation categories of free quivers is just uh, sorry, F, F of a point to the end. So it, it completely splits. And so the, the upshot is that this term here is a sum of this term. Okay. So, um, yeah, so in particular, if, if you apply kind of, if you take um, the merit of torque variety and you, um, you apply this this fact, and and then you apply HKR. You, you recover um, you recover um, uh, sort of properties of the cohomology ring of torque varieties, which can be checked for more simple reasons. Okay. Um, final thing I want to mention is um, quantitative symplectic geometry. So, um, so far in this talk, I've entirely talked about upper bounds for uh, dimension of Fukai categories. And uh, upper bound I mentioned, uh, I described, comes ultimately from arborealizing and applying the, the Cauchy properties. These are the two main ingredients. But there are, there are other upper bounds which um, one can consider. So one, one upper bound is uh, coming from left left shift vibration. So if you have a Weinstein manifold, then it always admits a left shift vibration. And you can ask, uh, what is the number of critical points of the, this, this left shift vibration? Or in other words, the number of thimbles of vibration. And, and this gives an upper bound for the dimension of the I think there's actually a minus one type of one. Is this, this is the Fukai category. I'm sorry? The, the Fukai category. Uh, the wrap Fukai on? Yeah. Okay. Without any stops or no partial. No, no, this is just the full Fukai category, no stop. Um, and another upper bound uh, comes, uh, so if you have a, a compactly supported generic Hamilton diffeomorphism, you can ask. What is the number of intersection points of the skeleton with the image of the skeleton under a compact under this diffeomorphism? And if you, you take this skeleton to be the zero section of the cotangent bundle with the canonical Weinstein structure, then you're asking uh, some, a very classical problem in subjective topology, which is to estimate the number of intersection points between a Lagrangian and its Hamiltonian push off. And, and there is a bound coming from formology. But this quantity turns out to also be bounded from below by, by the dimension. So, if you have lower bounds on the OK dimension, then this also gives you uh, information about quantitative problems in symplectic topology. And do you assume some transversality in the right, right hand side? Yeah, so this has to be generic, which means that. Generic. Yeah. Um, dimension. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry. I, I, it's a type of yeah, dimension. Yeah. So the dimension of the, this thing is going to be less. But sort of the, the point of this is that the skeleton can be singular. So um, if the skeleton is smooth, this is going to be worse than the bounds you get from uh, floor homology. But if the skeleton is singular, you don't really have floor homology. So, so you do, unless you can still say so. Um, of course, you need a lower bound on the left hand side. And this, there are lower bounds that one can obtain, but this is sort of a different story, which I, I'm not planning to talk about today. But, um, but in any case, uh, yeah, this, 
So the main point I was trying to make is that this theory of dimension for Foucault categories is actually connected to some really classical geometric questions in symplectic geometry. And to me, it, to me at least, this is a, something I'd like to look at some more. Okay, uh, any questions? This is... This is a, the end of, I'll stop with the going to ask so can you say anything about um, maybe upper bounds or, or something that uh, something with like what I mean by upper bounds is if you look at the order of spectra rather than just the dimensions or anything that can be stated there yeah so um we didn't really consider well of spectra so much uh we, we did briefly and we seemed like we couldn't say anything using these methods but we didn't try so hard. Um, so it's, it's possible that similar methods can be used. If you maybe just forget the symplectic geometry, you try to construct the co limit or category built out of local pieces that you understand and try to make its dimension large. You succeed in that way. Just trying to understand the, the, the obstruction to kind of creating a for example, to, to end or realize that there might be instruction categorical something about algebra or is it something about algebra? I wouldn't know how to do it, uh, even with even with arbitrary mechanics. categories. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean it can't be done. <laughs> yeah. Well, thanks. Right. Thanks a lot. Yeah.